Welcome to season one of the Overcomers Podcast. We are going to talk to you about overcoming adversity and living your dreams. If you've ever struggled, this is for you. We're going to talk to you about such struggles as drug addiction, relationship struggles, parenting struggles, incarceration, being displaced from your home. We're even going to touch on things such as sexual assault, or even if you just struggle with finding your purpose, finding your passion, being part of a community, this is for you. Like I said, if you've ever struggled, this is for you. So welcome to the Overcomers Podcast, where we're going to help you to overcome the adversities of life and live your dreams. Welcome everybody to the Overcomers Podcast, here with friend and fellow masterminder Sarah Apgar today. She is the owner, CEO of Fit Fighter, and let me tell you a little bit about Sarah. So Sarah is a mom, she's a volunteer firefighter, she's a veteran, she is the wife of a busy doctor uh, who is, you know, handling all these things as a health professional during a pandemic. So thank you, Sarah, for making time to be on our show. I am super psyched to be here. I've got my kids in front of the TV for about 45 minutes, so let's rock it. Awesome. <laughs> I'm awesome. clock ticking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. You know, keep them busy for so long, right? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, our show is about overcoming adversity, living your dreams, and I would love to just dive right in and take us to this point where you're in Iraq and you were the platoon leader. Um, I'm sorry, what was uh, your title at that time? Yeah, platoon leader as a second lieutenant. Second lieutenant, platoon leader. And can you tell us a little bit about what happened, the adversity that you had to experience there to lead you to where you are today? Because what you're doing today is actually to honor that past experience. So take it away if you could share with us. Yeah, absolutely. So starting in the present for me, yeah, immediately, you know, brings us back sort of quickly to 2003, 2004. Um, when, so if you can imagine three weeks after I've landed at Fort Carson, Colorado, which is my first duty station with the Army Corps of Engineers, I am on a chartered aircraft, American Airlines aircraft to Kuwait City, we had one stop on the way on that flight in Vicenza, Italy, which is this very sort of surreal memory I have because we didn't get off the plane. It was for refueling and, you know, adding some soldiers to the, um, to the chartered flight. But out that window, I saw the Italian Alps and it was sort of this like, you know, these snowy mountains in the background. And yet, you know, I knew in my mind, like what I was mentally preparing for was landing, you know, in the desert, in the Middle East, in a war zone. And so I have these sort of like, there, there's like a vividness to a lot of these, these memories visually for me um, that are, again, just like powering everything you know, I'm doing today with Fit Fighter. Um, so when we land in Kuwait City, I'm, I then immediately head up to Mosul, Iraq, uh, which is where my platoon that was supporting the 101st Airborne Division was doing its work. And my platoon was actually waiting for me because in the military, you basically rotate into a unit that needs a, a leader of, of that level, like a platoon leader. Somebody else has rotated out to a different unit. And so I'm basically absorbing 33 men and women. Um, at the time, it was 31 men and two women in my platoon, some of whom were 20 years my senior, uh, much more experienced. And that's very unusual um, sort of unique thing about the military is it places young leaders, young officers with very experienced platoon sergeants and squad leaders. And there's this incredible synergy and in leadership and expertise and experience um, that I think there's a, we can all learn from. So I absorbed this platoon and you know, we effectively have to start working, you know, in this war zone together, building trust, building relationships as quickly as I could so that we could accomplish this mission to help reconstruct Northern Iraq following the combat operations. And three months into that deployment on December 16th of 2003, I lost the one soldier I ever lost under my command. He was 19 years old. His name was Nathan Nakis. And I've actually since then talked with his parents and asked them about um, talking about this story, you know, openly and freely to make sure that they were comfortable with that. And they were happy to have, you know, Nathan's memory honored, of course, as, and, and fueling people as much as it could, because he was an extraordinary young soldier and individual um, and just 
you know, you, as you can imagine, so I'm talking fast partly because it helps me get through the story um, without, you know, sort of um, that kind of devastating, like just implosion. So I, I, I lose a soldier and, and the time of that I spent then those days and weeks and months afterwards of leading this platoon of soldiers, some of them had far deeper relationships with Nathan than I ever had, you know, through that experience and then back to the United States after the deployment um, is seared in my mind as, as if it were yesterday, you know, every day. And I've spent the rest of my professional career working to be in, you know, professional positions that can work to try to honor the memory of this um, amazing soldier who didn't get to live the rest of his life and have the impact that he would have. And so with Fit Fighter, our, our charitable contributions, our support of friends, the, the essence of our, our products, even in our equipment and our training to help people be stronger and better are all really centered around trying to, um, you know, trying to honor Nathan and, the, and that work and those veterans. Such an amazing story. And, and you know, there's so many uh, points right there to touch on. Um, first of all, thank you for your service. Uh, you know, thank you, Nathan, uh, for what you've done to inspire this woman to become such an inspiration to so many. Um, you know, this is a perfect time to talk about leadership, right? We, whether you're leading a platoon in Iraq, leading yourself through this pandemic, leading your family, you're a mother, uh, you're a volunteer firefighter, so you know that's how all this you know ties together in the way that you're honoring him. So whether or not you're leading at the fire station, uh, leading a company through this pandemic, you know I know I'll be you know having a few listeners that are fellow fit pros trying to figure out what to do with gyms that are closed right now. So um, can you talk a little bit about as you were sharing? It must have been intimidating to me to the first time that you're put in charge of a group of people that have more experience than you. I mean, that's a challenge to your leadership. You know, you must feel a little bit inadequate. Am I equipped to lead these people? You know, should they be leading me? You know, how did that go? Tell me a little bit about that synergy that you described. Yeah, yeah this is, I, I mean, I'm so psyched to have the opportunity to talk about this in this setting and these like, these, the really like these deep challenges of leadership that all of us are facing, as you said, whether we're trying to be like a, a parent teacher right now, you know, in this current cri public health crisis, or, you know, whether we're, we're leading a small team in a corporate setting, whether we're a, a fit pro leading our clients, you know, it's like, you know, the same, I think the same challenges exist in terms of how we build the basis of trust in a relationship um, between a leader and his or her team and how we set expectations of each other so that this is the most, you know, productive relationship possible. You know, and we all feel like this is a scenario where people are working together in ways that become, you know, stronger than those individuals, which of course is ultimately, you know, the power in teams. And, you know, I remember again, like it's yesterday that how terrified a feeling it was to literally stand in front of that formation. You know, that's what every leader in the army is asked to do when they come out of their initial training is, you know, a formation of say four rows of eight soldiers standing in front of you and you take command and there's a physical aspect of that in terms of calling them to attention and then asking them to stand at ease. And there's a lot of these disciplinary sort of measures related that are um, that almost create uh, almost like more sort of a formality that that's even more terrifying. And, you know, there's there's great reasons for it. You know, I, I, I also always loved the discipline and structure, um, actually, the military. But, you know, that that's that's a disarming feeling. And I, what I remember thinking to myself is there's no possible way I could stand in front of these people and claim that I know more than they know right. or that I can do something that I can't mm -hmm. because, or that I had experience that I've never had because I'm like this 23 year old, you know, super green off nine months of, you know, basic training and then four years of uh, leadership, military science and leadership education in college as part of the ROTC program. And that, that's it. Otherwise, I'm like in my early 20s, you know, and standing there. And I remember thinking to myself, like, well, like one of my strengths is 
building relationships with people and showing them how much I care and respect who they are and what they know and what their experience and expertise is. And so I'm going to start by saying to these people straight up all the things that I just like said here to you guys, like, this is what I know and I don't know. This is what you can expect from me, you know, that I will care for you, listen to you. I'm extremely organized. I'm responsible for your mission, success or failure. You know, all of the things that, you know, you, in yourself and your values, you sort of are as a leader. And then I said, this is what you can expect you're not going to get from me. You're not going to get, you know, deep expertise and experience in running, you know, combat missions, you know, and, and sort of here's, here's some of the ways in which I'm going to lean on you and in which I think we can be successful together. But, you know, I'm going to ask a, a lot of you as, you know, part of this team and like my subordinate leaders. Um, and I'm just, you know, I'm telling you that right now. And, um, and I think that that, like those moments where people, you know, those leaders realize like they're going to be, they're extremely important to me. And I'm acknowledging that like, I can't possibly be successful or help our team to be successful without you. And, and um, you know, and, and so that, that was really, I think for me, that was my way of, of sort of creating a really disarming and diffusing what I think otherwise can be those sort of like classic, like leadership conundrums, you know, between like the leader and the follower. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit of riffing, I guess. on like, you know, kind of what my experience was taking over those teams. Well, I'm taking notes right now uh, because, you know, for our viewers, for our listeners, I think that there's an important takeaway there. And it's that as leaders, we don't have to have every strength. We don't have to have as much experience as some of the people that we're leading. You just demonstrated for our viewers and listeners a very important quality of leadership, which is authenticity. I'll tell you what I am and I'll tell you what I'm not. And yet at the same time, I'm in charge of leading this group. I don't know, for, for me, I'm like, I'm proud that I'm, when we first started, we were the best coaches on our team. And I still think we're pretty darn good. But well, you you know, I think, I, you know, when you were talking, I was like, this is so, that's um, obviously in, in a different setting, but I was always a, a worker, you know, like, um, you know, I, I got a paycheck every week. Um, I was a great worker, always on time, very reliable, you know, those kind of things. And then when we decided to open up our own fitness center, I was super frightened and and so at first it was just he and I. Um, and so once we started to hire on team, you know, a team, once we, we grew enough where we could, I started feeling like, oh my gosh, you know, how do I, I've never been a boss. How do I lead? Like, you know, I'm not, what if they, they have more experience, you know, they're better at this or, you know, and, and uh, it's, it's really like a whole tug of war thing. And just being able to be like, listen, this is what I can offer. This is what I'm not good at. I need help at is, is super. Uh, it's, it's, it, the authenticity is just what you said. And I was like, that is exactly who I was. I was like, listen, I'm really good at these, not good at that. Need your help, you know, and, uh, but I'm going to work beside you alongside you, you know? So, um, yeah, leadership. It's a, it's a challenge, you know? And at the end, of the, at the end of the day, leadership is, another role to play yeah right uh we don't have to have every degree that the people on our team have we don't have to have the years of experience that the people on our team have but we do have a role to serve as a leader so let me ask you sir what is leadership to you like if you were to sum it up you know could you all your experience in the military could you just kind of describe what leadership means to you yeah uh leadership to me is bringing out the best possible highest performing and most highly productive work and um, spirit of any group of individuals coming together as a team. Mm. Love it. Very good. And and I, I think, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And I think that's it. I mean, I think if you've accomplished that you're not always going to succeed and you're not, um, you know, and sometimes you're going to fail because of other 
you know, other factors and circumstances around us. But if we're able to accomplish that, I think it's hard to ask any more of a, you know, group of human beings. And um, so that's the way I always think about it. You and I talked a little bit about something uh, prior to the show about even having to lead yourself through a postpartum depression uh, at a difficult time. Uh, I believe your husband was in residency at the time. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you've led yourself? I, I think that there's some similarities here. I think that we're running some parallel lines as to how you've led yourself through that adversity of Iraq, uh, through the postpartum depression. Uh, there must be some tools that you've used that would really benefit our listeners and viewers. Could you share a little bit about that? Yeah, I'm happy to. And I, you know, I wish it's like hard and we're not in person because I'm sort of getting goosebumps. You can sort of see like a little <laughs> um, because this is very, I, I, now that I'm, I'm, sort of on the backside of that experience um, with that postpartum depression as a mom, I try to talk about it as much as possible because I think it's definitely a taboo topic um, and topics like that I think are taboo um, that are so highly personal and also lead people I think to feel like they're failing. Um, and so I'll start by saying that, so imagine this at age 37 as a first time mom, having been through, you know, an elite collegiate athlete, ROTC, been in the military, been in early stage companies in my business career, been a volunteer firefighter. And the first time that I ever sought professional therapy for my emotions and my mental health was after I had my first baby. And you know, I think back to that and I'm thinking like, gosh, I mean, it can be anything for anyone, you know, any time at which like there you just there's like this imbalance and and things happen and you're sort of thrust into situations where, you know, mental health becomes squarely like, you know, something that must be addressed. And so I say this to groups of veterans I talk to a lot, like, you know, you, you have to you have to remember that and reach out, you know, for support at that time. And we have to like as a community of friends and family and especially fitness professionals who are with people to, you know, at times when they are working to be stronger and better and more ready, um, you know, we have to, to really try to like make as comfortable an environment as possible to be talking about these things and make people feel like it's time to reach out for help. I just felt for the first time literally ever like I was failing at everything. I was trying to be a new mom. I was trying to breastfeed and that wasn't going super well. And I was trying to go back to work really fast as a professional. I was trying to be a good partner to Ben who's in this crazy residency. And I felt like I couldn't do any of those things really well. And my physical weight, I'd gained probably like between 40 and 50 pounds with both my girls. I'm just like a small, I'm 5'2". So like I'm a really small frame, just gained a lot of weight, even though I was very strong and very fit. Um, and so I was also overweight and trying to lose weight all at, one, all at this time. So it just was, um, I just like tipped, I, I liken it to people when I say, I just felt like I sort of went like, you know, like I just tipped over <laughs> and it was like, couldn't scrape myself up off the floor without, um, without getting some help and going through like a deliberate process. So what I, what I think about in the end is I definitely layered on a lot of those lessons we've just been talking about for personal leadership and overcoming adversity and obstacles in terms of setting milestones for yourself day, week, month, year, you know, to achieve goals, um, really orienting yourself around relationships and teams and your sort of village around you and making sure to kind of nurture those things in your life. Um, and then, and then health and wellness, of course, you know, just your physical fitness. So I layered all those things on that I was used to having to implement in all of these times of adversity. And then also sought, you know, that, that element of professional therapy for my mental health um, that were those additional exercises, which of course, um, you know, psychologists and, and um, 
psychiatrists are trained to help you with. So um, that, that was really where all of that kind of came together and, and what I consider to be a, a very culminating mental readiness and health um, experience for me. And I'm, the good news is that I can sit here also saying that that was hugely successful because now I feel like I'm, I'm like tipped back up. <laughs> yes. I love that. Those are good tips, you know, reaching out and circle. Go ahead. Sam. Yeah. So um, you have two children. So when you, you know, I, first of all, I'm really excited that this is part of our conversation today um, because just like when you first started out, you said that it's kind of like taboo. I think a lot of people feel it's, it's not true. It's not, it's not a real thing for women to, to go through this. So I'm really excited that we're talking about it um, because it is a real thing. Um, and that you were able to get through and be, you know, like feel, you know, tip back up again, uh, standing tall. Um, when you had your second child, did you go through it or were you like, because of your therapy and stuff, you were fine on the other side of that? Or was it with both? Great question. I, you know, I didn't, I really didn't go through that same postpartum depression. And one of the things that's interesting is I can tell you like that I, that's sort of why I know like the differentiation between like being exhausted and just like tired because you're like right. post -child, yeah. like you had a kid, um, gave birth and, and being a, a person with compromised mental health and depression. And I know the difference because I can distinctly describe, you know, like those, those mm -hmm. differences and feelings. And so it's a great question to talk about because I do think people wonder if it's their first child and they haven't experienced this before. Like, is this really a thing? Like you said, like, or am I just like, do I need to just like buck up and right. you know, power through? And I've experienced both. So this is a perfect segue. Uh, Cindy's question about, you know, how your first child's experience, your experience with your first child helped you to uh, be better prepared for your second child. You say uh, that your mantra is readiness over uh, fitness or strength. Uh, you know, maybe you can say it better. And that, that really takes us to the Fit Fighter mantra. And basically, I would love to hear, you know, how you decided as a volunteer firefighter, um, you know, as a veteran, as somebody that wants to honor the loss of a soldier, uh, to start the company Fit Fighter. And, and tell me about that mantra. You know, how does that, you know, come in? You, know, you would. Yeah, re ready for anything. That's my that's my big cheese now. Um, that's what we're like, you know, that's what we're like working to do and all the stuff we've been talking about, you know, with just this, you know, this sort of this 20 year career of like weaving, you know, public service in and out and sort of momhood and everything in between. Like that's kind of what I we I just landed on that by accident because I I keep I kept thinking to myself over the first couple of years of working with firefighters on fitness training and just starting this started as a very um, very much like sort of a, a garage hobby and something I started to do um, you know for passion project and I started to think to myself like this is what we're trying to do we're we're trying to be ready for that call like every time no matter what's happening no matter what time of night it is like we're trying to be ready for that next thing our everyday demands you know as moms we're trying to be ready for like that constant like I'll use my hand to be like and then I need this and mom I need this <laughs> and then like and then the phone is calling from work with this and um and so that became sort of just my thing and now that's like my big team cheer you know um so you know when five years ago when I first moved to a Long Island for my husband's medical school I, is when I joined the volunteer fire service because I missed the camaraderie and the community of the military. I'd always missed it when I decided to come, get out because the deployment cycle was really intense. And, you know, Ben and I were looking at being married and starting a, a partnership together 2008. So I really, over the next, you know, four or five years, I, I did, I did miss you know, what that lifestyle is about and what that feels like to always have that unit and that camaraderie. So thought just being a volunteer and, you know, helping out, being an EMT, 
and our local community firehouse would be a great way to get some of that back. And, and it a hundred percent was, you know, there's a lot that resonates in the fire service and that experience um, with being in the military. So what I realized though, and as fitness professionals, you know, people are, you guys and, and others are always, you know, fascinated by this fact that the fire service, unlike the military does not have standardized fitness training and testing. So in the military, every single morning, 6 a.m., PT, they call it physical training. You're in your, you know, better or worse, you're standing there in formation. Okay. You do some form of thing, and then every month you test against the same exact test that everybody else has. In the fire service is different. You do a test to become a professional firefighter called a CPAT, and it's a candidate physical aptitude test, and it's eight different you know, fire ground skills that test your strength and stamina for fire ground movements. And then once you're, you go into your firehouse, it's up to the leadership at that firehouse to maintain your physical and mental readiness standards. And I found that to be fascinating because gosh, that, as you know, that means like, you know, we're probably going to get, you know, significant difference in what's being required. And yet on the fire ground, you know, that, what's required in terms of decision-making and physical and mental emotional competence is the same for every firefighter. So I basically trying to make sort of long story short, tried to start, you know, developing programs that I thought, you know, movements and training and group fitness and team fitness that I thought would mimic better the requirements that we had on the fire ground to be loaded with weight, to be under very, very high pressure mentally, to be on compressed air, mm -hmm. operating in that, metab that high state of metabolic conditioning, um, to be climbing, to be on the ground all the time, you know, doing all that groundwork, search team operations. And so I started to divide up the fire ground and the movements required into a set of five circuits in these programs that would effectively train for each of these sort of buckets of, you know, movements. And so what that led to, and then we sort of needed the tools because we needed to be loaded with weight as often as possible doing this training. And as we know, weight loaded training is extremely important for everything from posture to sleep to, you know, immunity. And so we started to use tools from the trucks but of course it's very dangerous. You know, we were using like steel axes and halligans and, you know, trying to like sling around this stuff. And then I realized that fire hose, which is like the bread and butter of firefighting um, is actually this extraordinary, extraordinarily simple, um, but sort of nimble, flexible, strong, durable tool. And we just needed to find a way in a setting where we weren't attached to a hydrant charged with water, you know, pulling 200 feet of hose around, we could mimic those movements. And so the first ever prototype of what's now the commercial steel hose that we implement into the mainstream fitness setting um, was invented and we, we did it in the firehouse. We started filling, um, we found this sands and steel shots and grits and all different kinds of stuff we had lying around and we would stuff it into this rubber lined hose and then clamp the ends with hose clamps and PVC pipes and like little eye hooks on the ends. Um, and I'll send you guys a photo of what that first prototype was like, because now that you're going to get your first steel hoses, you're going to be like, whoa, it's sort of like a cool evolution. Um, and from that point on, we refined this tool to be something that not only would train that grip strength and that basic hose handling skill of that lifeline on the fire ground, but also lots and lots of other, you know, loaded rotational metabolic conditioning core, you know, grip related movements just with this single tool. And so we kind of over time said this, we're, we're designing this single tool that can keep us ready for any situation that we, you know, are going to encounter. And like, that was the spirit of Fit Fighter when it was kind of first born. That's oh, awesome. That's awesome. That. Well, thank you for not only being a hero, but also deciding to dedicate your life to making our heroes more ready. And just for our listeners, for our viewers, if there's some fitness enthusiasts, it's all functional fitness. So this readiness mantra, readiness over fitness or strength is really for everybody. It's not just if you have to go into a fire, it's if you want to live life better, right? Uh, can you talk a little bit about how just to cross over, just to emphasize that if you would, Sarah? 
Yeah, hundred percent. You know, what we realize is that firefighters, first responders are public servants are the, the, the pinnacle of this idea of, of joining the body, mind, spirit, and emotions into one notion of being ready for your everyday demands, that, that thing that you never expected to happen. And I, I can imagine a moment in time um, that would, you know, resonate that idea more than this moment right now <laughs> in the time we're in. And, um, and so what we realize is that the spirit of that and those public servants and those first responders is really a thread that exists for all of us. And we all have people where other people were taking care of outside of ourselves. We have elderly parents and we have kids and we have students in the community and our, our teams at work and in our lives and also just situations we never imagined having to encounter. And so the, this concept is, became this, you know, that really connects us, I think, in ways that we don't really explicitly realize. And we're all a lot closer than we think in that way of needing to have that same spirit every day. So this, this Fit Fighter tool, I'm so glad that we connected because I was looking for something, especially for those that are working out at home. And we have seen people pick up jugs of detergent uh, use paper plates and water bottles under our direction, uh, <laughs> yeah. heavy purses, uh, their kids' backpack filled with books. Can you talk about some of the exercises that you can do with your weighted fit fire or fit fighter hose? Uh, you know how that works? You know, what are some of the exercises people can anticipate being able to enhance uh, with that tool? Yeah, hundred percent. Well, and of course, always have my little um, five pound prototype hanging out with me on the desk. So. <laughs> <It's a friend. laughs> that's yeah. <laughs> that's oh, that's like so to see it. Whoever watches it. Okay. There we go. Right, awesome. And actually, now see this is like now stitched with the grommet on the end. That used to be the hose clamp with the eye hook, you know. And then it's got this really nice feel for it, um, which always maintains its shape. Unlike sand, you know, there's steel in there that flows like water. Um, so it's this really beautiful feel and, and the real fire hose really is this amazing nylon rubber line material. So anyway, I sort of always people joke because I carry these things around in my purse. Of course, when you're an entrepreneur, as you guys know, you know, you are you are every second of the day. You're a representative of what you stand for. So um, anyway, that is to say that what's really cool about the steel hose is that we're, we can load just about any movement that we can do, you know, that we would do in a, in a setting of circuit training, high intensity interval training, in a setting of mobility, warm up activation, in a setting of power training, agility training, you know, footwork, um, true power lifting strength training. We can layer in the steel hose into those movements and basically make it, you know, use the differential in weight, volume, and time to effectively, you know, create just the, you know, the, the most versatile sort of possible set of training. And so it's really cool because we can layer this onto the body, you know, it's soft. So we can put this like around our neck, we can put it on our shoulder, we can put it here at the sternum, at the hip hinge, at the ankle hinge, at the side of the hip. You can hold it, um, you know, in different grip positions. So we can do like a close grip or a mid grip or a wide grip, which is going to give us a lot of different movement in terms of the way that weight is distributed in our hands. And then we can also lift, swing, drag, heave, you know, toss the steel hose into the air because it's safe. It's got that sort of semi-soft feeling. And so, you know, when it comes to wanting to do continuous movements and complexes from your basic squat you know, lunge type complex, adding in like the power and explosion to that, to core work along the ground, bear crawls in which now we can drag weight with us forward, back, side to side. So I love like the core and ground work. Um, we can do a lot of really cool grip strength where we're flipping the hose and quickly dropping the hose into the other hand to really get that sort of proprioception. And we can do a lot of really cool partner work. We're going back and forth partner to partner with like a cross toss or, you know, some kind of cool, um, you know, any kind of cool like ISO tempo type of movements with one partner on the end of the hose and the other on the other end. So it's, you know, I mean, we could sort of 
go on for hours about the, you know, the versatility aspects, but that's why it was so powerful in this, in fireground training setting and why it's so powerful now for, you know, fitness professionals and just people at home looking to slide something under the couch or, you know, in the living room and uh, whip it out and have some fun. Exactly. Exactly. You know, so what you're saying here is that we have, something that can be used in place of a kettlebell, that it can be used in place of a dumbbell, it can be used in place of a sandbag. Uh, in fact, uh, with that uh, little uh, grommet there, you know, you can even set it up to work like rip trainers do. There, there's a lot of versatility with that. And I was very excited because people working out at home, they're not necessarily looking to install a major gym system into, but they're like, you know, I really could use a, a piece to get me through this pandemic. And and I'm super excited to use it with our team. So then that way we can incorporate it in the gym as well when everybody's back. My question to you, though, is you guys give back to a lot of different causes. And I think that this also ties back to the story that we opened with, which is a soldier that you're trying to honor and other things that are going on. So could you share uh, with some of the proceeds? You're not only training our heroes, but you're also giving back to different organizations that are also uh, for such great causes. So could you talk a little bit about what Fit Fighter is involved with? Yes. So we have a model that actually stems from my, my career in early stage companies. I worked for a company called Warby Parker that had this model of buy, buy a pair, give a pair. And I always loved this idea that for-profit companies can have incredible charitable partnerships that are able to really just grow the pie for everybody and, you know, let everyone do what they do best um, and to create you know, extraordinary scale ultimately, which is obviously my dream for Fit Fighter. Um, right now we're, you know, we're a small company, um, but ultimately create scale that's going to then enable, you know, fuel this charitable contribution. So we developed this collaboration with an organization called the Stephen Siller Tunnel to Towers Foundation, which supports veterans, first responders, and their families. And now, right now, in this crisis, it's always pivoting to support, you know, whoever sort of needs that funding. Um, and right now, that's healthcare workers and their families as well. So they do things like build smart homes for wounded veterans who have come back from overseas, you know, with um, terminal injuries. They do things, um, support mortgage-free homes for the families with kids of veterans and first responders who have been killed in the line of duty. And so this is just an incredible organization inspired by a 9-11 firefighter, Stephen Siller, who lost his life as he ran through the Brooklyn Tunnel back to the towers on foot um, in New York. So you guys are too. We're, we're right outside New York City. And, um, and it ultimately lost his life. And he had seven siblings that started this charitable organization and now is one of the largest organizations in the country supporting veterans and first responders. So we're, we're super psyched. A percentage of our sales, um, of all of our sales, steel hoses, training, et cetera, support those organizations. And I remain committed, you know, when fire academies want to have our trainers come run through a workout, you know, we provide them training calendars um, for their training academies using our equipment and just a ton of work also just like internal um, to what we do to be supporting training environments for first responders as well. Well, thank you. Thank you for supporting first responders, veterans, uh, healthcare workers. <laughs> uh, the timing of this is just amazing. Uh, I'm so excited that we can be filming uh, this podcast in the month of May. Uh, Memorial Day is just ahead. It's a great time to remember those uh, who have lost their lives, uh, who have served for our country, uh, fought for our country. And uh, thank you. Thank you for connecting your company with such awesome causes, uh, providing such a resource and such a, a versatile resource for people at home and whatnot. I, I feel like you've given so much to our listeners today. I was wondering if you might give... Uh, any final words of wisdom, uh, something maybe if you could go back and uh, talk to that younger self, that lieutenant that was standing in front of that platoon, uh, you know, what you've learned, uh, whatever it may be. I, I just think there's a lot that you've already imparted today, but if you could uh, kind of bring us home with maybe some rules of the road for our audience, if you would. 
Yeah, you know, it's it's funny because I think back to, I, I think about what I've learned over the years and, you know, a lot of times people say, gosh, like, you know, this is, you've t- sort of taken this path less traveled and, you know, and, you know, that that, and, and, you know, that this is sort of seems unusual, especially for someone who sort of grew up in a pretty, you know, pretty sort of average, like Baltimore County lifestyle, you know, and, and family and, um, and I think to myself that that I, I think that that sort of it makes it seem as if I've always sort of like exuded, you know, this overarching confidence or, you know, and, and sort of this like in general that there's been this this piece with like that that's always what I was supposed to do, you know, and that that was this was always the path that I sort of just imagined myself, albeit one less traveled. And you know, I, I'm here to sort of say that, you know, that's really, that's really not, it's not been the yellow brick road, like for me at all. Um, I, we just talked about a lot of the sort of adversity and the, the obstacles along the way, but also just like realizing that I think if I were to go back and talk to myself as a 22 year old, I would tell myself, you know, continue to share those superpowers, like those unique gifts that you were given that are innate and intrinsic to who you are. And for me, obviously, it's sort of this intrinsic optimism and this energy and it's sort of like, that's very, um, you know, self-motivated and internal. Um, but, you know, also don't be so hard on yourself to try to do everything and be everything for everyone. You know, I think also I've, I've struggled with that a lot. And that's something that can really, I think um, it can waver your confidence a lot, you know, as a person, if you feel like you, you, you take failure really hard, you know, and and it kind of hits you like a ton of bricks or you take like emails, like maybe something that's like really tangible for people is like you read an email and you like misinterpret it as something that's, you know, personally damning or whatever. And you just get like deflated. Mm -hmm. And that's me. Like people think like, ah, oh, you seem like the most super confident, you know, person. And um, I think over the years, I'm finally like getting there at like age 40. I'll be 40 in June um, with my two kids and like all this behind me, like finally starting to get there to be like at peace with all of that. So, you know, that's what I would say to my myself and to anyone who is a young professional or maybe a fitness professional or just listening and thinking about their own adversity, you know, because we all have those challenges, we can't be so hard on ourselves. And we, we just, we have to learn to, you know, accept failure and grow from it and keep sharing those unique gifts and those superpowers because that's what everyone needs. And then just go a little easier on ourselves for what we're not strong at and what, we need someone else to like, you know, bolster us up and, and uh, give as part of our, as part of our village. Well, that brings us back to that leadership lesson. If, you know, Sarah, you are such a lighthouse. We've had Damon West and Todd Durkin on here. Uh, people that are lighthouses just like yourself. And it's, it's so obvious that you've chosen, as Robert Frost would say, to take the road less traveled <laughs> and make all the difference, you know, because it, it certainly has you're making a difference in so many lives, uh, so many different people's lives with what you've started and with what you're continuing to do. So thank you for what you do. You guys are the best. Thank you for having me on. And so it was so fun to talk and just like riff a little bit about these stories and be able to share with each other. So um, yeah, look forward to continuing our work together. Definitely, definitely look forward to having you do a workshop for our coaches <laughs> so we can learn how to use this fit fighter tool and share it with our members. So thank you for being on the show today. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you guys.